The death of veteran Gregory Lloyd Edwards at the Brevard County Jail prompted a Florida Today investigation that found deputies violated 14 sheriff's office policy items. That report is available at floridatoday.com. Today you will learn more about how our reporters uncovered that information and what prompted them to look into this case. Welcome to Florida Today's I am Brevard, I'm Isadora Ringel. Today you will meet two reporters, Alessandro Morazzi Sassoon and J.D. Gallup. They will walk us through Edward's arrest, his final hours, and the Brevard Medical Examiner's reason for his death. Alessandra and J.D. Gallup, welcome on the show. So I've been watching you guys in the newsroom working on this story for God knows how long, and it's finally come out in Florida today, uh, and it's about a death in custody in the Brevard County Jail. Um, the subject, the person we're talking about is Gregory Edwards. I want, I want our viewers to get to know a little bit about him, who he was, how was he arrested, what happened, and what led to his death in the Brevard County Jail. Who wants to go first? Well, uh, Gregory, Gregory Edwards uh, was a 38-year-old father um, and husband. He lived in Grant Valcaria. Actually, he was a combat veteran who served in Kosovo and also Iraq. He met his wife a few years ago, actually in therapy for PTSD, um, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. The two of them married and moved to Brevard County, hoping to get away. Uh, but what's happened is that he had a situation in 2018, in December, where he had a psychotic break while visiting a Walmart. And uh, from there, he went into the Brevard County Jail and subsequently uh, has died. All right. It's something to note just on Mr. Edwards' background is, is that the, the post-traumatic stress disorder, the, 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 psych, the psychosis, right, which is what occurred at the Walmart, um, this wasn't the first time this had happened. This had happened a year prior, and he sort of had a history, according to his wife, of um, you know, being a little more uh, prone to such um, episodes around the holiday season. Um, he had been Baker Acted once before, and um, was taking steps to remedy um, his situation. The uh, VA clinic in Vieira that he frequented tracked his progress, and so we know, for instance, that he had stopped drinking, he had stopped smoking, um, and he was really uh, on the mend in a lot of ways. And so that sort of adds to the of the heartbreak. The setup, yeah. I guess, of, right. of when he's taken away, his wife thinks this is going to go down the way it did a year ago. He's yeah. going to get help. Right. Yeah, and then she and she tells the deputy that arrives on, on the scene that he has mental health issues. She, I think she explains a little bit about the medication that he was on. Right. Seems like everything was, up to that point, pretty standard, right? Right. To set it up a little bit more, this actually took place in West Melbourne. So it was at the West Melbourne Walmart. Uh, and, and, and to give you even more background, the, the wife, uh, Kathleen Edwards, was 38 weeks pregnant, and she was extremely concerned about her husband. He had not been sleeping. He was excited about this new baby that was coming along. And uh, according to her, he was acting erratic, even at home. She was worried about him. Uh, That's why she brought him to Walmart, because right. she didn't want to leave him. Right. She was worried about self-harm, right? She thought... Yeah. She, she, she sort of was in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of impossible situation of sorts. She had to go to the Walmart to get food, diapers, basic household supplies, right? They had an infant, to, you know, they had a toddler with them. Their, their daughter was already born at that point. Um, and they, and she faced the choice of, do I leave my husband alone in this state um, where I think he might hurt himself? I think he might... There's a, there's a possibility he might commit yeah. suicide if left alone because he's yeah. acting erratically, because he hasn't slept in several days, and because I suspect he might not be taking his medication as prescribed. And all of these things contribute to her decision to take him with her to the Walmart with the kid while pregnant, and she loses sight of him right as they walk into the door, and he trails off and jumps into the back of a truck. Um, and, and from there, the situation escalates. And... Uh, you know, t t to add to that, um, the West Melbourne police officer that responds is being informed by her uh, that this has happened before, that he has PTSD, that he is a veteran. And, and we see from the body camera of Officer Mathis, who's the first to, to arrive from West Melbourne Police Department, he takes over from 
uh, a civilian who's holding Edwards down after he's attacked a charity worker. Um, and he takes the relay, and he's holding him until backup arrives so they can restrain him. And he's holding him down, and he's telling him, relax, relax. Uh, I don't want to pepper spray you. I don't want to tase you. He's recognizing that this yeah. is a mental health situation, and he's de-escalating successfully in the end. Because when he gets in the car, for at least a great part of the trip, it's a long trip from West Melbourne to the jail, right. he is calm. He has periods when he seems a little more agitated. Right. Uh, so, but, so let's fast forward to when he's in jail. So he, when he's in jail, he gets into some sort of altercation with a corrections officer. Can mm -hmm. you explain what happens then and what led to him being restrained in a chair and then eventually uh, dying? So let's back up just for a second. So there's an hour and a half of him in the car, right? A whole bunch of time of them waiting in the Walmart par parking lot as paperwork gets filled out, including Baker Act paperwork, paperwork that has on it all the mental health information, all the background medical information that was pertinent that gets delivered to the jail by West Melbourne PD when they drop him off, right? So an hour and a half goes by, he's at the jail, and they put him in a holding cell before booking him. There he's given a change of clothes, jail issued shoes, a bag lunch, some time goes by. In that time where he's in that holding cell, he's still not himself. We have testimony from the deputies and uh, written reports from from the sheriff's office describing his behavior and this described as nonsensical he's having a conversation with himself he's shadow boxing he's doing push-ups and squats he's clearly not in his right mind and when the corrections deputy which opens the door to actually take him out and book him, book him with whom he enters an altercation with drops at the floor drops the jail issued flip-flops Edwards doesn't process. He says, here are your shoes, and then Edwards just sort of walks on by them. And the, the corrections corporal, in his testimony to investigators, says it's like he didn't process it. So on the one hand, there's a recognition that he's not altogether yeah. there, but then when the altercation ensues, they're treating Edwards not as a mental health patient or as somebody who is sick and not in his right mind but as a violent criminal instead. So he attacks that corrections officer, right? Yes. And then how many uh, officers show up to help restrain him? And there's some pepper spray involved, some tasering involved as well. So I mean this is where the video would really clarify exactly what happened, but in addition to the officer um, with whom the altercation starts, right, the two of them. He's trying to direct him down a hallway to get fingerprinted and photographed as part of the booking process into the jail. And as that occurs, something happens. And we don't know exactly what. The descriptions are somewhat vague. But he becomes uncooperative. The two go to the floor. And then as many as seven other deputies on top of him join into the fray. And whether or not there's seven all at once is unclear because that's where the video would really clarify it. But we know that pepper spray and taser and punching and kicking was applied, and then he was and just as a side note, that chair. video has not been released no, by right. the sheriff's office. Can you explain why the sheriff's office has not released it? Well, for that? one thing, uh, number one, uh, you've had situations happen at uh, uh, facilities like this across the country, you know, jails, uh, uh, prisons, and video has been captured of, of inmates uh, reacting in a violent fashion. And in a lot of cases, video is released. But in this particular case, the sheriff has decided to withhold it because he feels that it would represent some type of security breach. Does um, he explain what kind of security breach that he would doesn't. be? And we're talking about a facility that actually begin that houses, you know, 1,600 inmates and that there are dozens of people who are booked into the same area who are walking down the same hallways, all of this every day. Yeah. You know, so this is not a secretive It's not a secretive part place. Of, and, and I've been there, by the way, I've been there on a tour with my leadership class, mm. and we visited, I believe, yes. the booking area. So TV it's shows not, have been yeah. filmed in there. Yes. The, exe the exemption he cites specifically is one related to, you know, fire safety and floor plans being excluded from public record in specific situations if releasing such plans would be a... Uh, you know, compromise of the of the of the facility's security. The irony, of course, in that his in the investigation that gets that does get released to the public is the actual physical floor plan on paper. Schematics we have. The, yeah. We have the schematics of the fire safety plan of the jail. So, so the to cite the same exemption for the video of the altercation because it shows the super secret hallways. 
is yeah. I, I, I ask why and 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 no and I would say that no answer that was yeah. acceptable was yeah. given. So, I would say also let me just add to this. Uh, the sheriff uh, obviously we've, we've attempted to talk to him about this case specifically with specific questions and he's he said for the most part no he wouldn't wouldn't comment but the video that his office is holding along with the state attorney's office they have a copy of it as well should be in our estimation uh, made public or at the very least we should be allowed to review it or the public should be allowed to re uh, review it just so we can get clarification exactly on what happened um, it's the height of transparency to release all of the records the case is closed according to the uh, state attorney's office and uh, according to the sheriff's office their investigation is done and normally it's procedure that they everything release, is released at the right. end of the investigation. So let's move on to, um, because we don't have a lot of time, let's move on to, so he's put in a restraining chair uh, and 26 minutes, I believe, go by uh, without him receiving any medical attention, correct? That's right. And then, so, and Alessandra, your story touches upon the, the policy violations that occurred in, in that meantime and mm -hmm. in, in how they handled this case. Explain why didn't the... Why didn't Gregory receive any medical help until 26 minutes went by? I mean, the answer to that is I actually don't really know why not. Um, the policies that were violated mostly pertain to the fact that that should have happened immediately. Upon placement in the chair, they're uh, an, an inmate is supposed to be checked. After exposure to a, ta a taser, a subject who's been tased is supposed to be checked by qualified medical staff. Um, you know, and so you have compounded policy violations here all related to the same thing, which is the doctor doesn't see Edwards and he's not supervised in those critical first 30 minutes of being in the chair where continuous observation is mandated in addition to the fact that he's left in, in the cell with a spit hood over his head and the pepper spray on his face and policy clearly states you're supposed to wipe that spray off after you've restrained somebody. I mean, once somebody is strapped down in a chair and we're talking his hands cuffed behind his back, in a chair, leaning, you know, let's lean back. I mean, there's, there, he's no longer a threat to himself or others. At that point, there is a duty of care responsibility. Um, and, and this is where these, these policies are designed to ensure that that duty of care occurs. And um, there's a nurse in the booking area whose responsibility ostensibly would have been to check. Um, but in her testimony, she says that as a matter of practice, it would seem, uh, she doesn't go and check on an inmate of her own volition unless specifically instructed to by a deputy. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't quite line up with the wording of the policy. So it sort of seems like the nurses aren't given autonomy as a matter of practice. Now, we have a sample size of one here, right? This one instance. But she's referring to it in her testimony as kind of a general rule. So then we come to this issue of, what's written policy and what is actually happening on a daily basis. So what is the point of policy violations if the de facto custom and practice is different? So the policy says immediately after he's put in that chair, he's supposed to get help. Are they supposed to check on him every five minutes or every 10 minutes? 30 he... minutes continuously followed by 15 minute watches. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is, I was reading your story and they say that there was a window through which they could look into the room where he was in. And they say the window was a little blurry Cloud, or, or cloudy, clouded. Yeah. So did they Tinted ever go smoking. in the room to check on him or were they always using that uh, sort of blurry window? So he's secured in the chair at 1.57 p.m. 10 minutes later at 2.07, he's wheeled from the area where the altercation occurred into this holding cell by himself. Then from 2.07, 15 minutes and 44 seconds go by. So at 2.23 p.m., that's when we get in the uh, sheriff's office reporting of, of what happened, that's when a door gets open and people actually go in and attend okay. to him. And a few minutes later, the nurse walks in as well uh, at 2.26 p.m. So from there, you have your 29 minutes from moment of securing to, um, to when a nurse actually attends yeah. to him. Um, so when, he, when uh, after he dies, the, the medical examiner rules his death excited delirium, which leaves a lot of people scratching their heads. What does it mean? Explain what that means and uh, why is it so often used in um, law enforcement related death? So, I mean, excited delirium is a term that has its origins in the 80s. Um, it got a lot of play in the medical examiner's offices for Miami and Dade counties. Um, and it 
you know, proponents of it, researchers say that, well, this, this condition is rare and dangerous and is, and is related to an overproduction of adrenaline, right? It's, it's, it's you die from adre adrenaline overproduction. Um, but it's also not very understood. Uh, if, again, if you are to accept it as, as, as a scientifically sound concept, and there are people who study brain slides of people who have died after these diagnoses. Um, but it draws a lot of criticism because, for one, it isn't overwhelmingly accepted by the medical community. It's not in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is you know your 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 kind of reference book for for mental health diagnoses. It's not accepted by the American Medical Association. It's not recognized by the APA. It only kind of exists in this forensic police medical world, um, and. And as to why it always seems to coincide with law enforcement, I mean, it doesn't always, right? So, so we got all the deaths that we could from medical examiner's offices that were recorded as such um, in the state of Florida for the last 10 years, and we got 85 cases. And two-thirds of those, roughly, are law enforcement involved. Now, on the one hand, you can say, these are cases where somebody is acting uh, ex excitedly. They're acting, they're agitated, they're, they're drawing attention to themselves, they're going to draw the attention of law enforcement. The issue is, you know, when, these, when this diagnosis gets made, originally it, 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 it was made in the context of people who were on drugs, cocaine or meth. And he wasn't, right. and there was, he was nothing wasn't. in his toxicology No narcotics. Tests. No narcotics The only thing whatsoever. they could find was Benadryl. Benadryl right. and, and whatever other medications were administered to, administered to him in the hospital, right? That's all that came up. Um, and this idea that it would be excited delirium in a case without uh, stimulant narcotics is instantly begs a lot of questions um, because there's actually a very small intersection of cases. Out of the 85 cases in the state in the last 10 years, very few are actually negative on toxicology but positive on law enforcement involvement but almost all of those are you know involved law enforcement, involved law enforcement. and and who is questioning that um that that cause of death i mean there's a a state body that that it's like right. a state medical well, examiner a number of people are, are are asking questions about this number one uh when uh edwards uh, was pronounced dead uh, immediately after we began reporting, the sheriff's office came out and said that this possibly could involve uh, huffing. And if you know anything about huffing, it's uh, the sniffing of aerosol cans. And, and anyone who, who studies this note will tell you that that, ease, that quickly dissipates. If he had huffed, it was maybe the day before or sometime prior to that, and it did not show up in the toxicology. So there are questions about this diagnosis. Um, right. I mean, um so Edwards is autopsy the day after he dies, and the toxicologies take some weeks to come back. Yeah. But already a month later, the the medical examiner is putting in the death certificate that the cause of death is excited delirium and complications. Before the toxicology. Before all the toxicologies are and back. Multiple yeah. multiple times they're doing the toxicologies because they're trying to figure out something. They're trying to find something according to what what you see in the medical reports. It, the narcotics were not showing up, so they would go back and retest and retest and negative results. And there, there seems to be a lot of thoroughness on trying to find something in his blood, yet at the same time, medical examiners whom I showed the autopsy report to are not seeing thoroughness in other places you would expect to see thoroughness in a case where somebody died after a scuffle with police. Yeah, and could the, could the autopsy results be kind of overturned? Does that ever happen? There's it's, a, rare. It's, it's rare and it's complicated. The simple answer is yes and no. <laughs> the, somebody can, write, can essentially write a formal complaint to the Medical Examiner's Commission, which can review the work, but the Medical Examiner's Commission cannot overturn what it says on a death certificate. Only a judge can do that. But the Medical Examiner's Commission can review the, the machinations of the autopsy, it can basically look at the work of the medical examiner and say, you really didn't do due diligence. You didn't really follow the best practices that are laid out by this statutory body um, that regulates the profession, um, mm -hmm. and and that's about all they can do. So they can they can they can criticize the work and they can punish the medical examiner for the quality of their work, but they can't actually overturn the result. A judge needs to do that. Wow. 
So one of the interesting things that we, we have been reporting on since 2017 was when uh, Sheriff Wayne Vivey decided to stop bringing in third parties to investigate uh, deputy-related right. cases. Um, and this was one of the cases that was not investigated by a third party, such as the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Explain why Sheriff Ivey made that decision two years ago, and really, could could a third party investigation have possibly changed the outcome of this? Well, a third party uh, would have been uh, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and Wayne Hi Wayne Ivey, uh, the sheriff, uh, actually used to work for FDLE, you know, Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Uh, what he what he figured two years ago was that. His agency assists FDLE with their investigation, so why not keep it in-house and do it themselves? And we're, we're talking about cases that involve, involve law enforcement, uh, officer-involved shootings, deputy-involved shootings, things like that, and situations like what happened at the jail. That does beg questions from people who are observing from the outside. You know, for example, the widow. Uh, she sees this whole thing. She sees her husband go off, and she's thinking he's going to get help. He goes to the jail. He dies after a scuffle in that jail. She wants an independent investigation. Sheriff has the authority to keep it in-house, and that's where the controversy is. I mean, I, th I think the, 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 you know, the, the universal argument for third-party review is that it, there's confidence in the public that the, comp that the potential conflict of interest that somebody is investigating the death of their, uh, within their own agency, that potential conflict of interest doesn't exist, right? So, um, you know, that coupled with the the questions that have arisen now uh, from this case uh, certainly warrant the scrutiny of a third party, according to to most who are reacting to it. Um, the the other thing that is interesting to note is that you know the the sheriff has now said to the media, this is the most thorough investigation in his forty years of law enforcement, and uh, and that may well be true. I don't know. I haven't read all. Uh, investigations that have occurred in the last 40 years. But what I do know is that the criminal services investigation, which is what was submitted to the state attorney, which is what the sheriff was referring to when he said that, is missing the testimony of a couple of the deputies that were involved, including the one that deployed her taser. That they, testimony... Did they refuse to speak to They the refused to speak to yeah. investigators as is their right. Right. They um, have that right. Now, <laughs> their testimony does exist. Um, it was recorded separately in a separate investigation being conducted by the sheriff's office. Which was more of an internal affairs yes. investigation. By the staff services unit. And that investigation, that evidence, that testimony isn't submitted, to my knowledge, to the state attorney. And what and, does that testimony say? I mean, I can't summarize it for you in yeah. 30 seconds because it's a 36-page document. But the point is, he's saying that the that the that he made sure that the state attorney had every shred of evidence. That's demonstrably untrue. In the, given that there's a whole separate investigation including that includes testimony not in one investigation that wasn't submitted to the state attorney and was signed off on. In other words, it was completed the day mm -hmm. the state attorney released the decision. So the state attorney on the morning of July 1st clears the deputies of any wrongdoing under Florida statutes and that decision is based off of, again, the criminal services investigative services unit investigation by the sheriff's office plus the medical examiner's report. He makes that decision, and then later that day, the administrative services, the administrative investigation by the staff services unit that includes additional testimony is completed. And in that, they're considering internal policy violations. And those policy violations that might refer to the use of force, including the denial of medical attention, which falls under the force policies, that isn't addressed because it self-references the state attorney's decision made earlier that morning, and the thing is quietly put to bed. So is, was there any disciplinary action taken against those deputies? Four letters Four. of reprimand. What does that mean? Just goes in their file just and just, stays yeah, there? Just, like, but, like no, no, yeah. but no criminal wrongdoing. Yes. No. And they actually, state attorney Phil Archer actually commended the yeah. the deputies for doing that. He commended the, uh, the deputies. For their actions in attending to Mr. Edwards once it was clear he was in distress. That's the wording he used, which is, I think, interesting given that the policy violations that our investigation revealed specifically had to do with the lack of attention to Mr. Edwards following the moment he was in distress. And he also will not answer direct questions. We, we, we would like to talk to him as well. To Mr. Phil, Phil Archer. Yes. And now the widow, she obviously, she was nine months pregnant when this happened. Right. And I can only begin to imagine 
what her life has been like, but she has been fighting for this. She, she has actually written a letter to Governor Ron DeSantis. Right. What is she asking in that letter? That what kind of state action? <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's, she's asking for, uh, I think there's five demands. Uh, one, uh, one is to reinvestigate the case um, from the medical examiner's side. One is for third party review. Uh, legislation uh, on the state level that would make it a requirement. After all, I think Brevard County is the only county where the sheriff's office suspends th third party review with the FDLE. Every other county has an MOU, to yeah. my knowledge. A Which has kind of been like a, the normal s standard for as long as I think anyone can remember. Uh, as long as, uh, I've, and I've been covering uh, criminal justice in this county for close to 24 years, and Anytime there was a law enforcement uh, uh, situation that involved, uh, you know, a shooting or whatever, FDLE would be called in. The irony is that Wayne Ivey, uh, Sheriff Ivey, at that time, who was with FDLE, would be called in. And we have roughly one minute, one minute left. Right. But what is left for this widow? Is she filing a civil lawsuit against the Brevard County Sheriff's Office? What is left for her to do? Well, right now, uh, the remedy would be in civil court. You know, unless the governor decides to reopen. Uh, uh, some of this case. She's, she is struggling. Uh, she uh, and I talk to her every, every frequently and she is struggling right now to figure out what her next step will be. But she does have, from my understanding, a team of attorneys who are reviewing this. Um, you know, and the other thing they demanded, of course, um, was, was to release the tapes. Yeah. Right, release the tapes. Which is, we will continue one of the five to, demands. to request right. and hopefully. Mm -hmm. and, and also the, one of the more important things to her at this point, she wants the remains of her husband. She did get the body, but she would like the organs, which is, which is very unusual. The brain and the kidneys were not turned over to her uh, at, at his death. Yeah, um, that's one of the five demands. So this story is definitely not over, and great job on this story, guys. And thank you for being on the show, yes. and um, looking forward to the next stories. Thank you. Thank you. That's I Am Brevard for today. This episode, as well as other news from around the Space Coast, is available at floridatoday.com. See you again next week.